I was listening to the story about, it was a story of a family in Washington and the little boy called the Bigfoot the Cowboy Man. And he had, apparently it had made an effort to steal this kid. And it hit me. My children were in that playpen behind me with nothing but a mosquito net over them. It could have crept up behind me and taken both of my children and I wouldn't have known. His father just got like a Mustang or something from Wyoming, okay? He had it out in the corral because he couldn't put it in the barn with the, in the stalls with the other horses that would kick and made all the other horses nervous. Had a Seminole Indian working the horse trying to break it every day. They had it out in the corral. This skunk ape snuck up behind this horse and grabbed it on its hind quarters. This particular horse kicks out, jumps over the corral, runs into the pasture, you know, to get away. At this point, the rancher's out there just blasted away with the dirty, dirty. Skunk ape runs into the swamp. I went up there uh, one day after that, or two days after that, I went up there and sat in silence up there and it i'm telling you man it was free it was crazy you know it was it, there was a crazy vibe up there still i did what i could to kind of get things under control but i told her i said you need to get off this property i, I feel like no matter how strong you are it's almost like standing in the ocean you can't stand still without moving your feet you're going to get knocked over eventually no matter how strong whatever it, you, you can't withstand a barrage of, of weird spiritual energy What is up, everybody? There she is. Welcome yes. to Paranormal Odyssey, Friday edition, Paranormal Odyssey Live. Welcome, everyone. Lisa, how's it going, ma'am? Uh, tired this week, but I'm so excited about the show tonight. Our guest, I'm just, I'm stoked about our guest yeah. tonight. Yeah, we uh, got a pretty good one tonight. A An actual Bigfoot legend, uh, Mr. Daniel Perez. Very, very excited to to have him and we're going to get to him in just a moment you've had a pretty big week haven't you yeah we had a uh, premiere for the film uh, god's country song which will be out father's day weekend um and as we get closer to that i'll i'll pop up a trailer and um we have one more premiere in nashville in june that i'm really excited about but this was the the world premiere for the stars and the cast and the crew and, and everybody to kind of come together and see the movie for the first time. But we've got a bigger premiere in Nashville in, in June. Oh, wow. That's uh, that's awesome. Where was this premiere at? Uh, it was in Bentonville, Arkansas. Okay. And uh, I'm telling y'all, when the soundtrack drops to this, it will be your summer playlist all summer and into the fall. It's so good. So many, so many big, up and coming country singers are on this soundtrack. And then our star, Justin Gaston, he's going to blow people away with his, with his music and his voice. So he's uh, an actor and a singer. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Very cool. Very yep. cool. Yeah. You sent me the trailer and uh, it looks good. Yeah. Like a good movie. It really does. Yep. I'm excited. All right. All right, let's go ahead and get into it and get all this stuff out of the way. If you guys have not done so already, please hit that subscribe button. We would appreciate it. If you've had an encounter and like to come on and share it with us, you know, all you have to do, the first step is shooting me an email. You can get me at wayne at paranormalworldproductions.com. Love to hear from you. I want to invite everyone to check out our website, paranormalworldproductions.com. If you would, head over there and check out the website. Show some support to the uh, all the shows. This show, Sasquatch Odyssey and True Crime Odyssey. We would appreciate that. Also, I want to ask everyone to check out my research group, Manimal Research, on Facebook. The uh, gentleman that we have coming on here in just a few minutes is a member there and, and shares some stuff pretty regularly uh on the in the group there so we appreciate that all right guys if you have any questions tonight and i feel like you you probably 
will, considering what we're going to be talking about. We have a room full now. I mean, it's it's packed tonight. Awesome. So if you guys have any questions at all, please help us out. Lisa, especially, and she's going to be on the lookout for questions tonight. But if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them, but please put those in all caps. Just uh, makes it a little bit easier for to catch for Lisa to get to them. And uh, Daniel knows that the possibility is there for questions. He's expecting them. So uh, if you guys have anything, you know, don't hesitate to to send them over, and uh, we never have to worry about any problem with. Our guests, we, we, everyone's always respectful, so that's, that's not an issue, so I don't have to say anything about that. All right. Lisa, are you ready? I'm so ready. I'm so excited. Me too. Let's uh, go ahead and bring him on. Daniel, how you doing, sir? I'm doing just fine, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much for, for taking the time out of your busy day in sunny Los Angeles. What's it like in Cali today? Well, today's a warm day, but uh, prior to today, it's been very cool and rainy in Southern California, actually all of California. But now it's starting to warm up, which is a good thing. What What is the temperature usually around this time of year in California? Oh, Probably around 75, between 75 and 80. Very okay. comfortable. Yeah. That's the term sunny Southern, sunny California or sunny Southern California. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've been in the 80s down here and I'm in Tennessee and Lisa's in Arkansas and it's gotten up to about 90 a couple of times down here. It is, it gets miserable in the summer down here. It's cold right now. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what day I'm wearing clothes. Start out in a sweater, switch to t-shirt, back in a sweater. So yeah. I'm ready for some 80 degree weather. Yeah. yeah. All right, Daniel, let's, uh, let's get things rolling with, uh, first off, I want to hear what got you started in, in the Bigfoot world. Uh, what piqued your interest? Was it an encounter? Um, just, just what happened and when to start us yep. off there? Most people who followed me over the years, uh, I can trace my roots to my interest in the subject matter to one movie that I saw at the Walk-In Theater about 1973 when I was about 10 years old. And it was called The Legend of Boggy Creek. And it just, uh, as I said before, it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks because they were talking about this creature and at the time, 10 years old, I didn't know whether they were talking about like a fictional creature or a real creature, because again, you're 10 years old and you're looking at something. This movie was kind of a uh, documentary style, but also thriller style too, kind of a mix, a docu-thriller, so to speak. And so when I was done with that movie, it just kind of lodged into me and I was wanted to know more. And so somehow, probably within the next year or so, I kind of started figuring out what they were talking about in that movie, uh, Boggy Creek and the Falk Monster, that this was like this Bigfoot thing. So I went to the library and uh, I started uh, checking out books on Bigfoot and that's how I got going. So I got going very young. That's that's how I got started completely. Yeah, you, you talk to a lot of people, and that movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, has has meant something to so many people. Normally, what you hear is the, the Patterson Gimlin film. Obviously, is what got people interested in the subject. But but next, I, I have found all the people I've talked to. And that's the first question I ask everyone that I bring on. And it's usually the, the Patty, Patty film and then the legend of Boggy, Boggy Creek. That yeah, for, for me, I was not aware of the Patterson film till much later or a little bit later by way of a commercial advertisement, I think for a movie called the mysterious monsters. And I think that was part of what they would call 
today the trailer that you saw a commercial on TV. And that's when I kind of became aware of the Patterson Gimlin film. But even before it was the legend of Boggy Creek that just really sucked me in. And uh, I guess if I were a drug addict or an alcoholic and the movie was about either of those subjects, I would have been dead by now. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, yeah. You, we talked about the, the Patterson Gimlin film and you know, that's a good segue into, into what, you know, I think we're going to be talking about the majority of this episode is just how much, all the knowledge that you've acquired over this film and just your, your experience with it. It's my opinion. And I've said this before, the whole mystery with Bigfoot was solved in 1967. In my opinion, that film proved to everyone that there is an unknown North American primate walking around in the woods. I don't know what else people need to see once you look at that, that film. What was your opinion the first well, time you saw it? My, I guess my first opinion was something like there seems to be something more going on here than what you would consider like a movie that you saw on television where there's a man in a gorilla costume. It didn't have that look and feel to it. And uh, so that's what, you know, I knew there was something there to it that looked very real to me. And so as the years went on, I gained more knowledge about it. But let me backtrack just a second here, is that in the early middle 70s, I started collecting some of the books and there weren't a lot of them out. But somehow I managed to find a book, I guess, on the track of the Sasquatch by John Green that was published in 68. And so on the back of the book, he had his address there. And then I saw that he had, I guess, maybe two more booklets. And so I ordered those and I also wrote a letter to him and he wrote back, probably didn't know I was just a teenager at the time. And then the same thing with Sasquatch by uh, Don Hunter and Rene de Hinden, that at the back of his book, uh, he had a postal address and I wrote to him as well. And he wrote back. And like I've told various people, it's like being an apprenticeship program with like Kobe Bryant and Wilt Chamberlain or Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, however way you want to slice it. I went, I, I got dialed in or plugged in straight to the top immediately. So it was good schooling. And so I'm 59 now. I didn't know that I would be active this long, but here I am. And I guess I owe part of the credit to those two individuals who are no longer with us. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit it right on the head when you compared those guys in their field to, to Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, or, you know, cause th those were, were big time and uh, it's awesome. That's not everybody can say that they had, you know, mentors like that. That's, that's awesome. Very, very cool. Um, the main question that I want to ask you and the question that I have when it comes to the Patterson Gimlin film. And I feel like a lot of people have this question in your opinion, how were these two cowboys able to get so close to this Sasquatch before it realized that they were on them? What happened in your opinion? My opinion is this, is that a couple of things were in their favor is that they were on horseback. They had three horses as they were going walking upstream on Bluff Creek. And so generally, if the creek is going south or you're going upstream and the stream is going the opposite direction, generally the, the wind is going to be heading away from the subject. So in other words, any smell is not going to be uh, push towards the subject, the unknown subject that was on that sandbar. And so that could have been part of the element of surprise. And so 
The other thing is that it certainly appears, based on my research, that the subject was squatting down in the creek and possibly getting a drink of water, in which case it may have been temporarily distracted. And so I'm writing about this right now. In fact, I was writing about it just yesterday that this may have been the element of su surprise that, that they were able to get so close. And so Roger, in his, part of his testimony that he told his wife, and I visited with Pat Patterson in two thousand May, June of 2009, according to Pat Patterson, which is the widow of Roger Patterson, she said shortly after the film was shot, that Roger was talking, in which case, in this case, Patricia Patterson's sister was in the house and she was uh, on a manual typewriter typing what Roger stated. And part of what he stated was that the subject was crouched down by the creek. And so that was his initial, the very first detection of what he saw and Roger was ahead of Bob Gimlin so he saw the thing first and probably within moments maybe one two three Bob Gimlin would see what Roger saw but and so by then the subject gets up turns around and starts to walk away and so maybe because it was distracted maybe because the wind was going uh, away from the subject and not towards the subject, and maybe because they were on horseback, that everything was different in which they could approach very close. That's my idea about it. And uh, still, you know, various researchers kind of have different estimates as to how close they were uh, the closest they ever were to the subject. And uh, by Roger's own admission, I think when he first saw it, he said it was about 120 feet. And then he was able to close that gap a little bit. But then as he stood still for the later part of the motion picture, the subject gains more distance. And you could see it on film as you get closer to the end of the film. Okay, yeah, that's... Uh... <clears throat> I told you before we got started that I had uh, an opinion. I, I have a theory of how they got so close. And you and I kind of agree on the biggest part of it. I think horses, the horses have something to do with, with the reason they were able to get so close. I think there's something to do with Bigfoot and horses. I don't know if they're fascinated with them. I don't, I don't know what it is, but this is just my opinion. Well, if, if let's just call the subject Patty from here going forward, mm -hmm. is that possibly the subject may have seen horses prior to prior to seeing Roger and Bob, and because it looks like a natural animal, like maybe it, like a deer or something, in a way because it's four legged, is that it wasn't intimidated, it wasn't scared. And maybe he had to do a double take, realizing that there were people on these horses that right. may, may have caused a little bit of alarm. But uh, I wanted to address another point that you brought up is that I think you stated that in 1967, this motion picture came in Roger Patterson's film, call it the PG film, and that you indicated it should have settled the matter right there and then. Well, a lot of people felt that way, but within that time from 67 to 2023, a whole new community grew up of skeptics and doubters. And they even have magazines called Skeptic and Skeptical Inquirer. And uh, they kind of feel differently about it in the sense that we feel that it's a biological real creature that we know as Bigfoot they see it as just a man in a costume. And so there's there's a whole community out there that has that point of view 
which I don't agree with, but you could see what happened from 67 to 2023 that there, the, there's this opposing point of view. And unfortunately, I don't think they have a lot of backing because as I've stated before, if it is just a man in a costume, then the proof is in that pudding in the sense that it's a man in a costume, then you should be able to duplicate it. Mm-hmm. But no one to date, they had all this time, almost 50 plus years, and no one has done it. They've tried to do it. In fact, they had the so-called guy, uh, Bob Hieronymus, in an ape suit trying to duplicate it. But uh, it doesn't come anywhere close to what you see in the original PG film. And so that that by itself should speak volumes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We, we've talked about it several times on this show. And I, I don't want to misspeak, Daniel, but I believe... Maybe you can correct me. And and I meant to look it up before we came on. I just got busy with my daughter and and I I wasn't able to confirm it. But either the couple years before or prior prior to the Patty film and or after the movie Planet of the Apes was out and they won the Academy Award for best costume. It was either before, right before or right after. And if that was the best that Hollywood could do as far as costumes, how did these cowboys, how were they able to do that? Well, that's, that's just it. And, and for the record, uh, it was just months later. It was, I think in February of 68 that the planet of the apes was released, uh, to theaters nationwide. So the PG film came first and then the planet of the apes. But yeah, that is a good point is that, uh, what Roger produced, is better than what we see in the planet of the apes. Yeah. So then the question is, you mean to tell me that a broke cowboy from Yakima, Washington was able to pull off something better than what we see in the planet of the apes. I mean, he could have been employed in Hollywood, but he wasn't, he was in Yakima, Washington. Right. And he, he went specifically to the bluff Creek area, him and Bob Gimlin, because there were reports of footprints in that area and they wanted to follow up and they weren't able to get there till October. And that's when they were hoping to see some more tracks, but they didn't actually, they did take that back. Uh, They were hoping to see some more tracks for a documentary that Roger Patterson wanted to make. But instead of seeing the tracks, they saw literally the track maker, and then they saw the tracks, and so they it was a two for one, so to speak. So yeah. Um, Plan of the Apes principal filming began in 1967, and the movie was released in 1968 and won the best Oscar for for that. And what year was it? 68 or 69 that they won the Academy Award? It was. Hold on. I think it was 69, but the movie came out in 68 and there is no way (laughs) I'm looking at the, just the makeup, the hours and hours of the actors in the makeup chairs. There's no way that those two guys could have done this. None. Yeah. But see, I agree with you a hundred percent, but again, the skeptical and doubting community don't agree because their point of view is that all you're seeing is something on film. It's not physical evidence in the sense it's not the body. And so a long time ago, I was of the firm impression that the only thing that is ever going to settle the question is a body of a Bigfoot and nothing else will suffice. I mean, we have from 67, one of the best films ever and uh, the world and science and the general public isn't buying it a hundred percent. But if you had a body, you'd have incontest, you'd have incontestable, robust physical evidence that no one can doubt. I mean, you you could doubt it, but there's the proof right in front of your face. Unfortunately, I think you're a hundred percent right, Daniel. That I say unfortunately because it's going to take the death of one of these things. 
we know that they're out there. We know that they have to pass away. They have to die. And the best case scenario is someone comes across one that's already deceased. Right. Right. I don't know that that's going to happen. So then you get the argument between the two different sides in the Bigfoot community, the biological versus the woo. Uh, do we need to kill one? And right. a lot of the biological people say, yeah, that's what it's going to take. We're going to have to have someone to take one of these things down. And then you've got the woo side that says, no, these are, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get into all that, but they don't want to see anybody hurt one of these things. And I can see both sides. I really can. Uh, I'm, I'm with you. It's going to take a body. If you have something like the Patterson Gimlin film and that's not convincing people, what's going to convince people? You said it, a body. What, how do you stand on that? Do you think one needs to be killed? Well, to prove it, yes. But just the idea of killing something that we're not really too certain about in terms of where it is in relationship to man, I don't know. Then you're getting into a lot of questions, ethical questions and whatnot. But then I would stop right there and I would say all the deer hunters in North America, you know, you can go shoot deer certain certain seasons on the provision that you have a license but then again look at all the poachers who go out without a license and do it anyway so i'm saying my point is it's, it's whether it's right or wrong is somewhat immaterial because it's not going to stop someone who's bloodthirsty who wants to go out and just bag one you yeah. see what i'm saying yeah it just yeah. because there's a stop sign out in the middle of the country at the railroad tracks, I'm sure there's a lot of people that they don't see a train. They're just going to blow right by it. Yeah, yep. you're right. You're exactly right. So Patterson Gimlin film, 1967, that's coming up on 60 years ago, 56, 57 years ago. Why haven't we been able to get more footage to get at least one more film? And people will argue the Freeman footage is, is good and i think it's great that's probably number two in my opinion on uh bigfoot evidence but why haven't we been able to get more footage on par with the patty film well two things that come to mind immediately is one the rarity of this the creatures the population can't be that big i mean people every day see dogs and cats that's because they run in the millions and they're domesticated. But something like this, we don't know what the population is, but one could suspect that it's very low. And two, it the data seems to suggest that we're dealing with a nocturnal animal uh, more than a diurnal, an animal that operates during the daytime. And so what Roger and Bob saw may have been this thing just getting up to get a drink and going back up into the hills to go sleep again. And so they may have, they may have just, you know, every once in a while someone does win the lotto. And so they, they hit the Bigfoot lotto in the sense that their timing was just right. And it's inevitable that sooner or later, something like that would happen. Now with regard to the Freeman footage that was shot in August of 92, well, the jury's still out on that too, but yeah, in terms of clarity, it's a very good film and a very good video because that was, by then, things converted over from film to video. And uh, why someone has not got another video, I'm not certain about, but I would suspect it might have to do something with the fact that they're mostly nighttime creatures and mostly the numbers aren't that big. I mean, it's not like every day, if we talk about a known North American animal, such as the wolverine, that you get good pictures or good video, right. even though, which actually I got to backtrack a little bit, just last month, I think, or earlier this month, they got some footage of wolverines in the state of Oregon, which kind of was surprising in the sense that uh, wolverines have not been noted in the state of Oregon for quite some time. In fact, decades, if I'm not mistaken. But well, it does happen. So, yeah. I mean, it could be, I mean, the show could end today with you and I, and tomorrow someone might get the best 
footage ever of a Bigfoot. I don't know. So why it hasn't happened again, I'm not certain about. Uh, but you have to look at who Roger Patterson was in that era. He was he was a, a trailblazer, literally, in the sense that he was going against the grain and he was hell-bent on doing his Bigfooting thing. At the time, the late 60s, he had three children at home and a wife. And, he, and when I spoke with Pat Patterson, his widow, I said, well, how do you remember Roger when he got the Bigfoot bug? And I think what she told me, just a few words, he was always gone. Mm. And so once he got that Bigfoot bu bug, he was always gone trying to find information or trying to go look somewhere where we could find some information or actually see one or tracks. And so he was he was gung ho. And so, yeah, it seemed like someone that gung ho, he'd probably eventually have success. Had he lived, had he lived instead of dying prematurely, who knows? He may have pulled out another. He may have gotten another footage. Yeah. You know, he was that. I never met Roger Patterson, but the people that knew him said that he was he was a short guy, about five foot three inches tall, but he was just full of energy. And so, and he, Bigfoot was his thing. Like, like I said, his wife said he was always gone. And so that, you know, and, he, and as he did, a, he was interviewed for a documentary in 68 by Dr. John Napier. And he says that in there, when he got that footage, that it was a great moment for him. And so, I mean, most people never see a Bigfoot to begin with. Not mm -hmm. only did he see one, but he had the pre presence of mind to get his camera out of his saddlebag on his horse to get some pretty decent footage. Uh, so yeah. what maybe what I'm trying to say, had it not been Roger Patterson, any other person on that horse may have not been able may have not been able to pull off what Roger did. So it's just really epic. Yeah, yeah. As a youngster, he did gymnastics with his brothers. And so because of his agility, that may have helped too, because most people don't realize that his, his horse reared up and fell over and he fell with it and he was still able to get on his feet. Wow. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I certainly didn't that's, know that. That's part of his testimony. And I'm right. I'm actually working on another booklet about the Patterson Gimlin film in 1994. And then later in 2003, I had a booklet that was called Bigfoot at Bluff Creek. And if I may, I'll show it to you. This is my shop copy. Let's see if we can see it up. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. And so these things are gold, very hard to get. They're all sold out. But since that time, from 2003 to 2023, which is what, 20 years, is a lot of things have changed in terms of, in terms of our knowledge about the PG film. And so I'll be filling in the readers with all those things that people are not necessarily too aware of. For instance... Nobody ever had, to my knowledge, on a tape recorder, asked Bob, see, when I got going, Roger Patterson was deceased, but I did have access to Bob Gimlin, and on numerous occasions, I consider him a friend and a colleague, and he's, I guess, 90 years old now. But I asked him, I said, when you guys him and Roger, when you were on that sandbar and started looking around after the creature departed, I said, uh, I asked him, well, how did that subject, Patty, how did she get there to that point where you first saw her? No one, I guess, had the presence of mind as an investigator or interrogator or someone who asked questions, asked that question. And he says, he says, well, he says, it's like this. When we looked right there at the edge of Bluff Creek, we only saw those tracks departing from that creek onto the sandbar and then away. It was just one thing. So that would imply that what the subject was doing to get to that point, 
because it didn't fly. Sasquatches don't fly. It was literally in the creek. And that would suggest something, an animal that possesses a great amount of intelligence that was deliberately trying to avoid leaving tracks. And so it may have got to that point, just walking in the creek, decided to get a drink, and there, there was disturbance by the horses and Roger and Bob, and then it had no choice but to take off in a different direction on the sandbar, because the only tracks that were seen on that sandbar were from the creek away as the subject walked and was filmed, and then that's it. And so that is really a very interesting piece of information because prior to that, uh, in the actually just a few months earlier, uh, John Green and Renee DeHinden were up on Blue Creek Mountain with various other people to examine the Blue Creek Mountain tracks. And there were two or three different individuals, I think a 15 inch track and a 13 inch track. And Blue Creek Mountain, from where they saw those tracks to the Patterson-Gimlin film site, as the crow flies, might be six miles. So that's basically the what I consider the same area. And so maybe maybe when they were examining that, those trackways up on Blue Creek Mountain, maybe the these hairy, furry creatures were looking at them from behind a bush saying like, what are they doing looking at these tracks? <laughs> and maybe Patty was part of them. And maybe she, they kind of said, hey, we should avoid leaving tracks. Wow, that, that's interesting. And, and since you talk about tracks and, and the ones to and from the scene, um, M.K. Davis was able to, to figure out something pretty interesting. With, with the trackway, with, with all of his work, uh, the work that he's done with the Patterson-Gimlin film. What's your opinion on the work that M.K. Davis has done, and, and particularly what he found out with the trackway? Well, I don't follow too much of M.K. Davis's work today. I think a lot of it's very colorful. Uh, but two things that he did that are, uh, I think, very significant, and I'll be writing about them in the book, I'm actually happy that you mentioned that, is number one, he was the Bigfooter of the Year, I believe, in, for the Bigfoot Times newsletter, which I edit and publish, for December of 2007, it may have been December of 2006, for his singular work, which is this brilliant, is that he found that you could see images on the film itself of what you would call, let's just put it this way, when a boat goes in the water and you look at the back of the boat, there's a, there's a wake that's created in the water. And so as the subject is walking on the Patterson-Gimlin film site, you could see indentations behind her in certain frames that you can't 100% say that those are tracks, but they're right in line with Patty and so it's highly suggestive that that is her individual trackway. And two, uh, I, I guess other people have done it since he did it. He did, I guess, one of the first runs of stabilization of the film. And so that was very significant in the sense that you're able to see the best frames of the movie stabilized. And so that was a very worthwhile project. So those two things that within the film itself, you can see indentations behind the subject that are highly suggestive of tracks in the ground because you can see the ground. And two, the stabilization of the film, which is, again, a very significant piece of work. Everything else he's done, I haven't really kept too much track of because he's done so much. It's just like I don't have time to review everything. He has done a lot. He has done a lot. MK has been on the show uh, once before and, and and i like him i think that he does really really good work um have you seen some of the pictures that that he's been able to to get of the the face of patty's face have, have you caught any of those i think i've seen some of it on facebook but how can i put it there's there's only so much you're going to get out of 
the grain on the film exactly to pull out. And the best work that was ever done was done by Rene de Hinden and Bruce Bonney in 1980 when they had access to the original film mm. and they made the Seba Chrome prints, which the general public didn't really learn about till much, much later. And really, I think until the internet got going and uh, uh, there were web pages and some uh, websites and then later social media, until all of that was put out there on a large scale that they realized that there were really sharp frames from the film. And that was from Bonnie, Bruce Bonnie and Rene de Hinden. And that work was done in 1980. And so that's their work, not so much MK Davis. And so yeah. MK Davis never worked with the original film. Bruce Bonney and Rene de Hinden did. So that's the difference. I mean, if you're going to have an opinion about a Picasso, it's not like you could be looking at a second copy to say like, oh, it's this and this and this. To really have an informed opinion, you have to come from the original. That's true. That, yeah. That's that's very true. Very what well. do you think about the upcoming, like all the AI technology that's coming about now? And what do you think that's going to do? to a lot of people that are doing hoaxes and stuff, because you, I mean, the AI technology now is, is mind blowing. Well, I think, I think it's going to be able to more quickly expose uh, the videos that are posted on YouTube and whatnot as to whether they're fake or real. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I don't think anyone keeps track anymore, but there's probably a new Bigfoot video posted to YouTube every week if all not the time every day, every day. <laughs> and everyone's scratching their head as to whether it's uh, real or not and i always tell people i said the first two questions you should ask is who took the who took the video who took the pictures and where and if you don't have that information back up walk away and forget about it yep that's great advice yeah. Well, it is because you have to know the source. I mean, if you look at the PG film, it was immediately, Roger pretty much immediately gave the location away because other investigators got to that film site. Mm -hmm. And we knew immediately within the day who was involved. And it was just Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. There was never a mention of Bob Hieronymus. He didn't, mm -hmm. he didn't inject himself into the situation until much later. And so that's basically my take on that. But no. getting, getting back with AI, I think the beauty of that, in fact, I was listening to a radio program on the way home, is that there are people in the community who are doing maps of North America with all the data points of sightings and footprints. And so what AI does is kind of looks at the past data and makes a predictive model as to what's going to happen in the future. Right. And so if you could crunch all that data, the more the data, the better, and say like, oh, here's a predictive model of what might happen in 2024. And it might say, you should be looking for Bigfoot in the state of Missouri or the state of Florida or whatever the case may be. And so, yeah, I think AI in general might be uh, a good thing to have. And with that said, the other thing is these uh, game cameras that are seem to be getting better and better every time you look up is that I think that's a very good application for what we're doing. And a lot of people think that, oh, they can sense them, they could smell the plastic or this and that. Well, eventually, I think there's going to be a Sasquatch that walks by that trips up that is not cognizant of this information. And we get some good footage. Yeah. So we can really hope. Yeah, yep. I think you're right. We got our, our first question of the night here. Daniel comes from Brown Dwarf. He asks, does Daniel know if there's any part of the PG film that has never been released? No, it's all been released. In fact, the first people to see the film saw everything. And that was Alvy Atley, John Green, Renee DeHinden. Jim McLaren, and possibly Aldi Atley's wife, if she was there at Aldi Atley's home. And that was Sunday, October 22nd. 
And so they saw the entire thing. So if there was anything not released, they would have known about it and said something because they saw the original thing and they never said like, oh, they've never released this or they've never released that. So no. But so those were the first people that Patterson showed the footage to? Yeah, in fact, the late Al Diatley was probably the very first person ever to see the footage by himself just to see if something was on the reel. Before Roger arrived, Bob Gimlin didn't see it originally on October 22nd at the Diatley home because he was home and he was sick and he was tired. And so it was uh, Al Diatley, Roger's brother-in-law, John Green, Rene DeHinden, Jim McLaren, and more than likely Aldi Atley's wife, who lived in that household as well. Okay, so they shoot the footage. They they get the footage. They have to be, you know, high on the hog, just in heaven. You know, we we get it. We did it. We finally got it. What's the first thing they do uh, after they get the footage? Do they immediately? Do they in the in the excursion right then and head back, or, or what do they do? They make the plaster of Paris castings. And then before they make the plaster of Paris castings, uh, they filmed uh, Bob Gimlin walking alongside the tracks with Bob's horse. And then uh, also they got footage of Roger making the plaster of Paris castings. And then they cleared out of the area and they stop in Willow Creek to tell actually phone Al Hodgson, who was living at the time, about what had transpired. And from there, they went out to the coast to quote unquote airmail the film. But according to Bob Gimlin, when I spoke with him, he says, I do definitely recall being at an, at an airport. And this was more than likely Murray Field. And what Murray Field did, it wasn't a uh, an airport where you jump on like a commercial airport like LAX, a people airport, but it was an airport with small planes that carried certain cargo from point A to point B. And so what that's what Murray Phil did at the time, and they're still open, and that's what they still do. They get things, say a set of blueprints or something, from one point to the other point. And so it appears that Roger had stopped there with Bob and that uh, Roger went in and had both of the films, the, the, the film of the subject and the film of the footprints, airmailed off specifically to his brother, brother-in-law, Aldi Atley, to take receipt of in Yakima, Washington. And so if you fly out uh, Friday night or say, for instance, the, the weather was bad Friday night, they could still do it first thing in the morning, uh, Saturday morning, which is October uh, 21st. And that journey from Yak from Murrayfield to Yakima is a little over 400 miles. So you could do that in, air in an airplane w within a couple of hours. And so Al Diatley has in his possession the films on Saturday. And there he takes them to get them processed. And then by Sunday, he has them all done probably by Saturday. And by Sunday, they're watching the films. So there's no there's no impossibility of that scenario. It's it's you could do it. Anyone can do it on the provision that you have a plane. Because they saw those films. First, the premiere. Showing of the PG film happened October 22nd in Yakima, Washington at Aldi Atlee's home. All right, we got uh, another question here. I'm going to throw at you. It's from Tea Time from Tiffany. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Tea Time with Tiffany. Taking into account how they stumbled upon Patty, in your opinion, do you feel that the Wood Knocks people do really make a difference in some kind of response from them? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I think anyone that wants to do wood knocks, I would not discourage it because, uh, I mean, a wood knock is a wood knock. 
whether it's a baseball with a baseball bat or with just a piece of wood that's on the on the forest floor is that uh yeah it's i would say it's a, a good strategy but back when in the early days of bigfooting no one was doing that but people were hearing these wood knocks and they were wondering who was making them and it sure seems like our hairy friends bigfoot are the likely culprits of doing this we're not certain why but perhaps it's a way of getting in touch with your neighbor yeah yeah um we've spent 50 minutes talking about the patterson gambling film and i, knew I have a question go ahead um Please. so what made you start the bigfoot times what made you do all of this well in january of 1999 excuse me january of 1998 i started the bigfoot times newsletter and my motivation for doing it is because at the time there were other newsletters out there and I felt that they were not as good as they could be. And so I wanted to produce a newsletter that was uh, really good and really worth the people who were spending money on a subscription to it. And so 25 years later, uh, the Bigfoot Times is the only one that still stands as a physical newsletter that is printed on paper and mailed out to a readership. Cool. There's no other newsletter in the world that can say that in when I started gradually all the other newsletters that were being published such as the Bigfoot Co-op and Don Keating's newsletter and a couple of Ray Crow's newsletter from Oregon they all went extinct and the Bigfoot Times still lives That's awesome quarter of a century quarter of a century and still going strong uh you and i were talking oh, a little bit before uh before we came on and um go ahead and tell everybody uh it's just you that that puts this together right it's just one person i'm the editor and the publisher and i get it printed every month and i happen to have a copy right here we can see so this is the january 2023 edition so this would be the mark the start of the 26th year of the newsletter it's always printed on the yellow sheet of paper it's four pages long it comes out every month and it's super easy to subscribe to and there's a lot of information as henry may from mississippi says there's stuff in the bigfoot times that you just don't find anywhere and so he's a longtime subscriber, and I'm sure he's a happy subscriber as well. Uh, true story. Uh, and you can verify this, Daniel. I subscribe today. So when should I expect my first? Uh, as soon as the mail gets there, because your mail was already dropped in the mail uh, a couple of hours ago. Oh, wow. So I I'm already about to get mine. That's awesome. We have another question. Is there a digital version of it at the present time there's no digital version of the bigfoot times but as time goes on because people have requested back issues we're going to digitize them and uh or make them available in a digital fashion for people to have them and so that's in the works but there's a it, i'm a one horse shop so everything that gets done is by one person alone so between publishing the newsletter working nine to five as a union licensed electrician and then uh working on my new book i've got my hands full yes you do because uh we were talking briefly before we came on and you're coming up on 900 of these things that you do a month right yeah so i'm i am literally an expert at folding paper, at stuffing them in an envelope, and getting a stamp on, and getting everything else on, I do it very quick. And uh, yeah, it's it takes a little bit. It the whole once the newsletter is printed, it takes about another solid two days uh, between work uh, to get them all folded, stuffed, and mailed out. And we got uh, a membership all over the world. The the state 
that has the most memberships is the state of Ohio for some reason. It's not Washington. It's not Oregon. It's not California. It's Ohio. That's interesting. There. I find that very interesting too. And I've only been to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference one time, picked up quite a bit of memberships there, and they're still going strong. I don't know what it is about Ohio, but uh, they love the newsletter. And so I, I never piss anyone off in Ohio. And then <laughs> in terms of uh, worldwide, it seems like the UK is the number one place that they get take the newsletter. Wow. Really? Wow. So Ohio, they... They love their grass man out there, huh? I guess they do because the, the membership there is bigger than Washington State. It's bigger than Oregon. It's bigger than California. And you would expect the opposite, but Ohio ranks number one. That's wow. just, it's just It's just one of those things. I'm going to pop this uh, back up here so that people can see exactly how they can get their subscription. And uh, it's what? less than 22 bucks for the year is that right daniel that's correct just go to bigfoottimes.net and you could get your own membership what i think is the most impressive it isn't just the over a quarter of a century of one man doing this by himself that's impressive enough but the fact that it's lasted this long in the age that we're in the mm -hmm. age of the internet everyone is digital you got you got your encyclopedia in your hand at all times you can look up whatever you want at any time but people still choose to pay you to send them four pieces of paper every yes. month so that they how awesome is that that yeah it, it that is a very interesting point because it, we are living in a digital age where everything's accessible on a laptop or your phone and instead people want to get a real piece of paper in the mail and for 25 years, this has been happening, and I'm just delighted to be the person behind it. You're doing something right, man. You, mm -hmm. you really That's are. That's what I say. If, you, if you've done it for a quarter of a century and it's still going, that, yes, you must have a, uh, the right ingredients. Definitely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. All right, Lisa, you got anything else? I don't want to keep Daniel. I have on. a million questions, but I think we should just bring you back for another another time because <laughs> I've just been sitting here listening and it's amazing. Yeah, like I said, well, uh, Daniel, I don't want to keep you all night. My, my, closing, my closing statement is that I've investigated for uh, a good part of my life and it's my opinion that what we call Bigfoot uh, is a living species here in North America that is extremely rare. It's not folklore, it's not mythology, but biological reality. That's my opinion. Yeah, and, and there is one thing that one question I did want to ask you. You, uh, you know, in doing the Bigfoot Times all these years, you do a Bigfooter of the Year. You give an award each year, right? How long have you been doing that? Uh, since the start. And okay. surprisingly, uh, Don Keating from Ohio was the first Bigfooter of the year. And uh, so that was 1998, December of 1998. And uh, at the time, he was younger, but he was just on fire. And he had a great Bigfoot meet there in Ohio every year. So uh, he is one of the legendary players of Bigfooting from the state of Ohio. And then... Coincidentally, uh, every year has always been a male. And in 2019, people, people thought, well, he's just going to pick another guy, another guy, another guy, another guy, because he's a guy and big footings for guys. But in 2019, B Mills, B-E-A Mills from the state of Ohio was the first person, first woman ever to pick up the title Big Footer of the Year. Wow. She broke the glass ceiling and I'm very delighted that she did. And it's just like, so we never had any discrimination going on. It's just a woman had never risen to that point, And then finally she did it. Yeah. And I, I don't know many people that would argue with that. She. I just think so many women, I don't know, maybe are intimidated to get into this or they're looked at as like, Ooh, you know, like I tell Wayne, I was a closeted Bigfooter, you know, for a long time, because you just kind of, 
do you really believe in that? You know, you get that, that stigma kind of, and I think women, you know, are just afraid to really come out and, and dive into the investigations and the research. And, and it is, it's kind of like a boys club, you know, a little bit, but there's, there's, there's some women that are really out there hitting it hard. Such oh yeah. Shelly Covington, Montana from Texas. Yes. Stop on big trips every year. So that's very uh, commendable activity. Oh yeah. I wish I could do the same, but uh, someone's got to pay the bills in my household. <laughs> uh, we got a question here. Uh, I already told you I was going to let you go, and I apologize, Daniel. Okay. But I did want to get this one in right here from uh, Dr. John Baranchog. He said, what is the criteria used to evaluate who gets the prize? There's no set criteria, but there is, it's something that, the person has done that's original over the top that distinguishes them from the pack. And say, for instance, in 2019, it was not just finding tracks for B mills, but it was the documentation of the evidence that became very important. So anybody could see tracks, but that level of documentation, not only that, but from the state of Ohio, the trackways that she has collected there's nothing that even comes close. I mean, she has plaster of Paris castings that would rival castings from the Pacific Northwest. And then to top that off, the castings that she has of some of the footprints have what we call dermal ridges on the toes, which makes it even more impressive. And she brought all of this to light. It was her investigative abilities. It was her dime, everything else that did all of this and uh whether she was a woman or a man it doesn't matter it was her work very unique very original and uh so yeah that there's no set criteria is the answer though yeah that that was a really good question john mm -hmm. appreciate it. Uh, i asked you i started this line of questioning uh, for one reason um you are a very re respected researcher yourself and, and you've gotten to talk to some of the greatest ever of all time and you put out this this newsletter every year where you pick the best in your opinion and if you don't want to answer that's fine in your opinion who is the greatest researcher who has done the most for the subject of, of bigfoot research well to date my opinion i would probably have to say john green mm. who passed away in 2016 uh, as a newspaper journalist and the books that he published, he kind of was able to categorize it, everything it, instead of this uh, stories from the backwoods that he was trying to make better sense of it, that kind of uh, from an anthropological point of view that it has certain behavioral characteristics and these are the reports and et cetera, et cetera. So, I would probably have to take my hat off to John Green, but by the same token, in terms of best visual evidence, uh, no one can stand next to Roger Patterson. He, he's alone in that category. So Green never got any footage, but still the amount of data that he accumulated prior to the internet becoming, becoming widespread is very very impressive yeah I, I would say john green roger patterson and i would not leave out ivan sanderson who published this mammoth book in 1961 long before you had any of those tools uh to do anything with i mean it was all done on a manual typewriter oh wow yeah all right yeah uh i agree i, I would agree with those selections all right Daniel, let's, I'm going to let you go, buddy. I, I didn't mean to keep you this much over an hour, but let me, let me just thank you for, for taking the time to, yes. to come and hang out. I've, I've been a fan of yours for a while and, uh, I've really enjoyed getting to sit and, and chat with you. I appreciate it. Me too. Thank you for having me. And let's hope that within my lifetime, at least that maybe we'll have some concrete physical evidence. That would be I'm great. Yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. You enjoy the rest of your day out in sunny California, sir. Okay. 
Well, thank you. And I'm tuning out. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. How was that? Uh, it went by so fast. And I'm just sitting there listening to every single word this guy is saying because was, he's phenomenal. That was the fastest hour. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, uh, I always say the best interviews are the ones that go by the quickest for some mm -hmm. reason. And this was the fastest interview. Yeah. That I've ever done. I couldn't believe when I looked up and it said 51 minutes. Oh, I know. I know. So awesome. Awesome. He was amazing. We had some, we had some good questions. Um, and, and just the people he's talked to. I mean, I it just blows my mind. The people that he's talked to in this. I'm so jealous. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's a, this was a good one and, and I appreciate it. Uh, and, yeah, definitely. All right, uh, everybody out there, I appreciate y'all watching, hanging out, everyone being respectful as always, the great questions, and thank you, everyone, for your support. Yes. We are going to get out of here. Y'all have a good weekend. Y'all be good to each other, be good to yourselves, and we'll catch you later.